Today, we're going to talk about the three diagnostic criteria for the hypermobile type of EDS or HEDS. Hi, I'm Dr. Claire Francomano, and this is my YouTube channel where we talk about all things related to the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and hypermobility spectrum disorders. The first criteria, and we determine whether a person has generalized joint hypermobility using a score called the Biden score. The Biden score is a nine point scale and one point is awarded for each of nine maneuvers that we ask people to do. The first question is, are people able to put their thumb down to touch their forearm? And you get one point if you can do that on the right and another point on the left. The second maneuver involves extending the little finger at the joint where the finger joins up with the hand. We call that a metacarpal phalangeal or MCP joint. And if that goes beyond 90 degrees, on the left, you get one point, And on the right, you get one point. Then we measure the angles at maximum hyperextension at the elbows and the knees. And if these are more than 10 degrees beyond 180, you get one point for each of those. So there's the potential for one point on the left, one point on the right for the elbows, and one point on the left, one point on the right for the knees. And finally, we ask people if they're able to touch the floor with their palms, in other words, put their hands flat on the floor with their palms flat on the floor, without bending their knees. And if they can do that, that's one more point. So a total of nine possible points for the Biden score. Now, depending on the person's age, the score that is considered generalized joint hypermobility will change. So for prepubertal children and adolescents, a score of six or more is required in order to say that they have generalized joint hypermobility. For pubertal adolescents and up through adults up to age 50, we consider a score of five or more to represent generalized joint hypermobility. And for people over the age of 50, a score of four or more is considered to be generally hypermobile. And this is because people tend to lose mobility as they age. The joints become less flexible. And of course, in children, we expect that they will be more flexible than adults. Now, I should mention that all three criteria for the hypermobile type of ehlers danlos syndrome have to be met in order to establish a diagnosis of HEDS. We need criteria one, criteria two, and criteria three to be met. So now we've talked about criterion one, and we'll move on to criterion two. Criterion two is a little bit more complicated because it has three parts, and two of those three elements need to be met in order to say that criterion two is met. So we have feature A, feature B, and feature C. And if two out of those three are met, then we say that criterion two is met. Feature A of criterion two includes a list of 12 elements that are assessed either on physical exam or historically. And those 12 elements include things like saw skin, mildly stretchy skin, high narrow palate with dental crowding, and piezogenic papules. Those are the little bumps that we sometimes see on people's heels when they put their full weight on their heels. We may also see atrophic scarring on the skin, which means that the scars do not heal in a straight line, nice thin straight line, but rather widen out over time. And also we look on the skin for a history of stretch marks or the presence of stretch marks which developed without a history of unusual weight gain or weight loss and not being attributed to pregnancy. Those are a few of the 12 items on that feature A of criterion 
two. If you have five or more of the 12 items on criterion two, we put a check mark next to that feature A. Feature B of criterion two is a family history of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And in order to satisfy this feature, it needs to be a first degree relative, so either a parent or sibling or a child who independently meet the diagnostic criteria for HEDS. If the person has a first degree relative who independently meets the diagnostic criteria, we can put a check mark next to feature B of criterion two. Feature C of criterion two is the presence of basically complications of the joint hypermobility. And this includes either pain in two or more limbs occurring daily for three or more months, or widespread total body pain occurring daily for three or more months, or a history of joint dislocations or frank instability in the person's musculoskeletal system. So joint instability, chronic pain, either widespread or in two or more limbs. And we only need one of those three in order to satisfy feature C of criterion two. So if you have two of those three features in criterion two, we can say that criterion two is met. The third criterion for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is basically that we have done our due diligence in thinking about all the other possible explanations for joint hypermobility and the various signs and symptoms that the person may be presenting. Have we thought about, in other words, a comprehensive differential diagnosis? We want to make sure that their pain is not due to some other cause. There may be autoimmune connective tissue disorder that is causing pain. And if that is the case, we don't want to use the pain as a criterion for establishing the diagnosis of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We also want to be sure that we've thought about all of the things that we consider to be red flags for other types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and other hereditary disorders of connective tissue. So if there is a family history of aortic root dissection or aortic aneurysms, if there's a family history of unexpected sudden death, if there are any of the features that we see in some of the other types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but not typically in the hypermobile type, we want to make sure that we've asked about those and that, that we've done some molecular testing to verify that those types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or other hereditary disorders of connective tissue are not present. The hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is the only type Type of the 13 types of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, for which we do not yet have a molecular diagnosis. We don't know what the genes are that underlie the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So it's very important to be sure that we have thought about all of the other types of EDS and all of the other hereditary disorders of connective tissue that may be contributing to a person's presentation before we slap the label of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome on that person. The diagnostic criteria that I've just described were formulated in 2017. We call them the 2017 diagnostic criteria. And you can see the full list, including the whole list of 12 elements under feature A on criterion two at the Ehlers-Danlos Society webpage. The last thing I'd like to say about hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is it's not just the diagnosis. So once we've established a diagnosis, there are likely going to be many symptoms that people are experiencing that need to be addressed. Things like dysautonomia or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a form of dysautonomia, mast cell activation, people's chronic pain, all of these things need to be addressed individually and regardless.
regardless of whether the person meets the diagnostic criteria or not, we want to be sure that they are in a medical situation where someone is thinking about their symptoms and making sure that all of those are being addressed to the best possible ability to maximize their quality of life. The comorbidities, which is what we often call the mast cell activation, POTS, dysautonomia, GI dysfunction, all of those things that often go along with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, those comorbid conditions are not really included in the diagnostic criteria, but they can profoundly affect the quality of life for people who live with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So it's very important to address those. That is a brief summary of the diagnostic criteria for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Thank you so much for spending this time with me, and I wish you the very best on your journey.